Welcome to 20th Century Geek. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and today we're going to be delving into the 90s, and a specific show from the 90s, one that's quite close to my heart. I really enjoyed it as a kid, and I've gone back to it several times since, and it's always uh, sort of held up, as far as I'm concerned. But let's talk about the 90s first. For those of you that were kids in the 90s, or even adults during the 90s, you may have realised or noticed that the 90s were, they were dedicated and really infused with a sense of the weird. We'd cut over the Cold War, the external threat was gone, and all of a sudden there was this sense of we should be looking at the government and other organisations that were around us. The growth of paranoia, you know, and uh, the fear of extraterrestrials. I mean, we had the Roswell tapes appear during the 1990s. And all this sort of culminated in the pop culture zeitgeist. It came through in many different ways. We start the decade with Twin Peaks on October 30th, 1990. Lynch brings us into this small town with surreal, odd soap opera dynamics circulating around the death of a young girl. Which, you know, you have the log lady and the FBI agents, all these weird kind of things. That's just the thing, that's the first small town. Just jumping ahead four more years. On September 19th, 1994, the X-Files starts. All of a sudden, the government is being investigated by the government. We have two FBI agents, Mulder and Scully, looking at all the weird cases that nobody else wants to acknowledge. The sense of the weird and this alien ex external threat, I suppose, really came through in all of our movies as well. You get films, everything from uh, Independence Day, I'm driving up to the end of the decade, you get The Matrix, this sense that there is no real, this, this sort of sense that, you know, should we trust what's around us? TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, again, that sort of weird horror that exists in everyday urban uh, and suburban uh, environments. All of this was going on and on and on. It was it was a massive thing throughout the 90s. Uh, again, obviously that would change with 9-11 in 2001. But for a period, there was a sense of sort of satisfaction and growth uh, in the 90s. And sort of nestled in that is a couple of shows that sort of probably needs revisiting. Because the other thing that was booming at this period as well, we have to realise, is from the, from the 80s, there had been a growth of child or youth based horror an acceptance that kids could enjoy these things and you know horror didn't have to mean um, horrific bloodshed and dismemberment and gore and violence it could really be about suspense and weird um, you, know, you have the growth of the, the of things like the point horror books from the early 90s the Goosebump series from R.L. Stein um, and uh, Movie directors like Joe Dante bring us films like Matinee. They'd already brought us Gremlins. We'd had Ghostbusters. Films that were aimed at a slightly younger crowd, really. Try to bring kids up into that sort of sense of horror and the weird. Now, today, though, we're going to focus in on a particular show. Now, we've talked about a surrealist small town in America. And we've also talked about two people investigating the weirdness and cases of odd oddness, crimes, um, combine those two, throw them together in a blender, and between the two, uh, in April of 1992, aired the pilot of the excellent show, uh, Eerie Indiana. Now, the concept of Eerie Indiana is quite simple. Uh, a young boy, Marshall Teller, moves to the town of Erie with his family because his dad's uh, work has moved. Should be simple enough. He's a young teen, aged about 13, and... Uh, introduces himself into the environment, into the school, struggles to make friends because he's come from the, he's come from a big town, he's come from California, moving into the small town. 
he ends up making friends with another kid, Simon. Another bit of an outcast, a bit of a loser, but a lot younger than him. But I think he's meant to be nine. And Marshall starts to notice that this small town is a bit unusual. Elvis uh, lives on his paper route. Uh, Bigfoot eats out of his trash. You know, all these kinds of weird things. It's an amazing show. I mean, to give you an idea of some of the episodes that was created, the, the I mean, the pilot in itself is the story of Tupperware for people uh, and how it's kept a young family young since the 1960s uh, and how it can do for other things. Tupperware, foreverware, they call it in the show. It's amazing. There's the introduction of uh, an ATM machine with an AI that becomes lonely and becomes fixated on giving Simon, who throughout the series it's, it's you know it's revealed that comes from a slightly disadvantaged background and gives him money for free bankrupting the town but making Simon a bit of a billionaire and having to sort of understand then this idea of is artificial artificial intelligence real intelligence where does a personality start does that have a soul you then get uh, the rev revolutionary dogs in an episode of young boy can talk to or hear uh, the psychic communication of dogs through his uh, retainer, through his uh, braces. And we find out that dogs actually don't want to be or, uh, our pets. They consider themselves slaves. And they're about to have, pardon me, about to be a revolution. And it gets dark because the, the kid with the braces dis disappears uh, when running into the night away from a, a, her, a pack of dogs. The insinuation, of course, being he was eaten alive. It gets dark. Um, you know, there's there's a, a in one episode there's a sentient hurricane, a hurricane that comes back to her eerie, uh, and if they haven't had a celebration uh, hurricane day regarding the hurricane, it will come and trash the town. And in this day, someone do, they don't have the celebration or it's being late for whatever purpose, and it does hit the town. It's bizarre. The, the imagination that went into this show was amazing. Um, they had a meta episode way before other shows were doing that kind of thing. I think the other ones I can think of is Supernatural did a meta episode as well, which was uh, pretty impressive. But in this one, Marshall finds out that he's actually a part of a TV show and he meets all the cast as themselves. Uh, obviously, hyped versions of themselves and vile Hollywood stereotype versions. But it's a great idea. Um, even to the extent that halfway through the show, they actually replace uh, the actor of one of the characters, uh, and they give it sort of a uh, a sort of a a cursory explanation, um, and then it's never mentioned again. And it's just a, an acceptance of the weirdness in this town. It is amazing. Uh, it was created by uh, Jose uh, Rivera, uh, Carl Schaefer, and of course the great Joe Dante. Uh, Jose Riet Rivera went on to write the the film The Motorcycle Diaries, uh, the early years of Che Guevara. Carl Schaefer has gone on to create the uh, incredibly popular, as far as I'm aware, Z Nation, a sort of alternate foot to The Walking Dead. Uh, I've only seen a few episodes myself. Uh, it's actually quite good. Um, probably not as good as The Walking Dead was. That's a different story. But it's actually good fun. And Joe Dante obviously created numerous uh, fantastic films during the 80s and 90s and went on to do some other bits and pieces. I mean, to talk about his uh, back catalogue, you're talking everything from The Howling and Gremlins and Matinee, uh, and he, he, he had a hand in so many of those things. And he actually sort of picked out some of his cast from uh, those films to appear in this, and vice versa, uh, from Omre Katz, who plays Marshall Teller, uh, went on to appear in both Hocus Pocus for Disney, but also starred in Matinee uh, a few years later, in 1993, for Joe Dante. So, clearly, Joe was a, Dante was a big influence on this show. But what else should we say? Really, this whole, the whole cast were fantastic. I really enjoy the cast. Omri Katz is a great presence. It's just surprising that he, I think he quit acting uh, in the sort of mid-90s after doing a series of things, which is a real shame. Um, Justin Schenker... Um, Shenkaro, Shenkaro, ah, Shenkaro, I can't believe I misspelled that, I talked to him later on, uh, played Simon, young Simon, he's gone on to appear in a whole number of things, appeared on uh, TV shows, and does voice work now across the computer games, cartoons, he's in Hey Arnold, uh, as well as a series of other things, uh, fantastic guy, but this thing actually like attracted all kinds of people, Like the, the, the guest stars in this were just nuts, 
Um, anyone who's a genre fan um, really should recognise some of these names. John Astin, the original Gomez Adams from the, the Adams family. Henry Gibson from The Burbs, Blues Brothers, as well as other things. Uh, Tony Jay, uh, Vincent Scavelli, uh, Matt Frewer, obviously from Star Trek. Um, Danielle Harris, uh, you know, young Danielle Harris. At this point, she'd appeared in a couple of the uh, Halloween films, where she gained her, uh, her celebrity. Um, and Dick Miller, uh, another uh, Joe Dante regular, uh, appears in this. Joe Dante, uh, obviously from Gremlins uh, 1 and 2. Again, he appears in Matinee. He appears in all of them. He's, he's a great character actor. He's in The Howling. A real character actor. I think I think he's great. Uh, other one is quite bizarre. Is Toby Maguire uh, appears in a, as an episode. A young Toby Maguire uh, in the Lost Letters episode. Uh, as a ghost of a person who sent a letter to declare his love. And that both he and the letter were never... Uh, well, the letter was never able to be delivered, so his spirit can never lay, lay to rest. Great stuff. I mean, that's the thing to, to, to highlight on that. There's an episode about that, about being trapped in an obsession for someone for so many years uh, and having to live on to that sort of beyond the grave. There are other episodes. Again, there's a character in this called um, Dash X um, who has literally a dash and an X on his hands. Or a positive and negative. It depends on how you want to see it. Um, and he appears out of nowhere. He just sort of comes about in one episode and he starts to just appear. And then his story grows and grows and grows where he becomes more and more involved. And eventually you find out there are, there's another person with a dash and an X. And that there's a, clearly an escalation of this story. Um, but unfortunately, this show was cancelled. 19 episodes were aired. And I think it's an absolute tragedy. It didn't seem to find the audience that was needed when its original run. Uh, I'm not entirely sure the time frame uh, or the time slot it had when it was originally aired. But it's a real shame because it's a great show. However, when it was rerun as part of a Saturday morning package, uh, I think several years after its original run, 94, 95, I think it was, uh, it was hugely successful um, to the extent that uh, I think at least seven of the episodes were then re uh, reused as um, novel adaptations, books. Um, and it actually driven more merchandise. The rerun of the show generated more merchandise than the original, which is bizarre. Um, but it also drove them to try and reboot it in an alternative dimension. So there's a kick-off where Simon and Marshall... Uh, talk to these little kids in another dimension in another version of Eerie and they start the whole cycle of investigating the weird again it didn't work um, it's literally called Eerie Indiana the other dimension um, I've seen two episodes of it it's not very good it really didn't capture the essence of the original which is a real shame uh, but Eerie Indiana is a fantastic show it's it's available as a single package the complete series on blue uh, on blu-ray on dvd uh, ready available on amazon uh, both here and in the states uh, and I highly recommend tracking it down. You can find it on YouTube. If you want to test it out, if you want to like this show, find it on YouTube first. Uh, there's all kinds of snippets. There's the the credits, uh, interviews about it. Track it down. It's amazing. This show's really, really good. But I'm not going to talk about it myself. All right? I, can't, I could sit here and ramble, and I have done for a while. But I actually had the good fortune to talk to Simon from the show, uh, Justin Schenkero, uh, recently, uh, to ask him about his take on the show, what he did there, how he found it, and other work that he's done as well. So uh, I'm going to hand over to me and Justin right now. Hope you enjoy. The first question is, how did you get involved in the show? Because you'd done some things before, you'd appeared in some things, but, you know, this, this sort of being... How old were you at the time? I was 11. So right. this was definitely my biggest show that I had gotten by that point. I had done some guest appearances on uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Who's the Boss, mm. a, a, a couple other shows. I'd done a lot of commercials up until that point, but this was definitely my first series regular part. So clearly it was a big deal, very exciting. Um, I had to audition. I ended up, you know, the audition process to be a series regular on a TV show can be very lengthy. Yeah. So I ended up having 12 auditions. And 
I had to go see like the casting director, the director, the producers multiple times. And I had to go to, uh, it's called the production company. Those are the people that actually put the money into the mm. show, which I believe was Hearst Entertainment. And then I had to go to NBC, which was the network. You know, they're the final deciding vote. And so I went to NBC, and I think it was between a couple of us, you know, for the play the part at NBC. You know, that's when they really whittle it down. So when you're initially auditioning, you know, there's hundreds of people, maybe mm. thousands, I don't know. Then they whittle it down to just like two or three people. So I go to NBC, I feel great, and then I hear nothing. And they call my agent, and they tell my agent that they're going to start looking to uh, for uh, Simon again. They're going to go through the entire casting process again to find you know, the part that I ended up playing. And I was, of course, upset. The agent was upset. We hear nothing for, I think, like about a, maybe three weeks or a month later, I get another call from my agent saying, they want you to come back to network. They want you to come back to NBC to re-audition. And they've brought in, you know, a whole new crop of kids for this Simon character. Mm. So I go in again, and, you know, fortunately, I was able to book the part. So that was sort of the process. It was very lengthy. Uh, but you know, I was very grateful to get it. And then we just jumped into the pilot, you know, which was the forever wear episode. Mm. And to this day, it's my favorite show that I've ever worked on. Just the cast, the crew, the writing, the material. It was so much fun and such an absolute blast. And, you know, my hope is that we can now bring this show back. I think that with the success of stranger things and, X-Files and Twin Peaks and all these reboots from the 90s, you know, Erie, Indiana, I think was really the catalyst to a lot of these shows and, and predated many of them. And uh, it was a fantastic show that should come back in a new life. Oh, I totally agree. It's interesting you say that because I was a bit, um, you know, being a 90s kid, um, I was well aware of the X-Files. I was well aware of all those sort of the goosebumps. Are you afraid of the dark? And obviously yeah. I came across uh, being a Brit, like, you know, um, uh, Erie, Indiana was shown on like our version of cable, and I came okay. across it on a friend's uh, on a, a friend's, and I was just like, oh, "This is amazing! This is brilliant!" And there's only yeah. 19 episodes, so I was like, right. "Okay, well, all these other shows have gone on, so you know, where's the rest of this?" Um, yeah. But it is; it's a precursor. It really is a setup for everything else really that came before, came after it. Really, You're right? Um, but what was the set like? Because it was obviously there was you yourself, Omri, and uh, yep. you know. Yeah, Jason came, I think, you know, probably 10 episodes or 11 episodes in. Jason Mars, who played Dash. Mm. And then we had some wonderful guest appearances. Toby Maguire was in an episode. Daniel Fisher. Yeah. I mean, you know, the list goes on of the incredible John Astin was in several episodes, you know, as the ice cream guy. And we had just some fabulous actors. And the set was a great experience. We shot at uh, CBS Radford, which is in Studio City in L.A., it's a sort of a small lot. It's not like a huge studio like a 20th Century Fox or a, a Paramount or a Disney. It's more of an intimate kind of studio. It's mm. smaller. And uh, I loved it. You know, it, you really got to sort of know your neighbors in terms of like the other shows that were shooting. I think next door to us was Dinosaur. Remember that show, yes. Dinosaur? So yes. they were shooting next door to us. Next door to Dinosaur was Evening Shade. I don't know right. if you remember that. It was with Burt Reynolds. Right. Um, so it was, it was just like a fun, sort of intimate studio, and the set was awesome. We shot a lot of exteriors at CBS Radford. They had, um, they set up sort of the exterior of what our street looked like, so we would film a lot of that, and then the interior shots were shot, you know, inside the big studio. Mm. Uh, but, you know, a blast. There was a lot of times, you know, our little uh, hideaway, they, they built stairs. The art direction was amazing and with a lot of cobwebs and a lot of that smoke. So as a kid, it was super fun. It was like being in a playground. But, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to act as well. So it was really, really neat. I mean, one of, one of the sets, for example, uh, the episode where everything goes, you know, like missing, like that your one sock. Uh, yeah. And all that stuff disappears. That was the most expensive set at the time. It was like a million dollar set. The art director, who was brilliant, just went to town and created this magical set. And you walked in, like I walked in as a kid and was like, "Wow, mm. this is where everything goes and disappears." <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the I love that set. I mean, I was going to ask about that actually because 
This show ninety one, you know, was filmed in nineteen ninety one. There's there's yeah. very little. I mean, you know, there's some CGI in the credits and all that sort of thing. But there's no heavy CGI. All those things are practical. And That's right. So many of the effects and the sets, and like I say, the Bureau of Lost Things and yeah. um, all those character designs are brilliant. They're just so good to be practical. You're right. Um, they totally are. And like you said, there was no real CGI or anything of the nature back then. So it was just beautifully set up with the art directors, the grips, you know, the DP, the direction. Of course, started with the writing. And it was a lot of fun. I remember in the ATM episode mm. where, you know, Marshall's father sort of becomes the, the ATM and he's giving me all the money, which was wonderful. I wish I had <laughs> <in> real life. <laughs> um, you know, that was when we were shooting it, obviously it was sort of, I'd be in front of the ATM and it was green screen. So they ended up having him come in later. But I mean, in terms of effects, that was, that was sort of a big effect. Yeah. Everything else was very much practical that we would see in the tornado episode, for example, you know, when everything was moving around, they just had massive, huge fans. That cr- like, literally we were like being blown back because <laughs> these fans were so huge and blowing so much, you know, air towards us, but it, it looked like a tornado. It worked. Mm. They it, it put leaves in front of the fans so the leaves would go all over and, you know, we were just moving around. Well, see, I mean, you know, because it seems that um, when it was being made, I mean, this, you know, it was put together by uh, Jose Schaefer. Uh, Jose and, Rivera. That's yeah, it, Jose, Jose Rivera, Rivera, sorry. Yeah, and, Sher- yeah. Schaefer, yes. But it pulled in some serious sort of directors. I mean, you were directed by Joe Dante yeah. for several episodes, and he was also a consultant on the show. So what was that like, dealing with, like, Joe Dante? And Yeah, Joe Dante, you know, he was, uh, he directed the pilot. Mm. And, I mean, he's brilliant, you know. I mean, he's one of the top directors of all time he mm. was just great he was very hands-on uh really had a brilliant vision for how he wanted the show to look and he created the aesthetic and it was just wonderful i mean as a young actor being able to work with one of these fantastic great directors was a real gift uh to gain all that knowledge early on and the way they worked with me was wonderful you know really you know they wanted me to bring so much to the character and so much to each scene mm. and i loved it you know it was it was a great great opportunity and and there we went on to have wonderful directors as well that have gone on to be you know pretty famous directors mm. film directors or tv directors a lot of them early on in their career were directing episodes of eerie so it was it was pretty cool to be able to have the you know the the good fortune to work with so many so many wonderful directors i love as an actor working with a great director that you know, a lot of directors sometimes are just focused on the camera setup and the lights and how the scene will look. Yeah. And not so much in terms of performance with the actors, which is fine. Some of them are very hands off, but I think we were fortunate. Carl and Jose did a great job in hiring directors that were very hands on with the actors, which for me as an actor, that's just, I love. I love, you know, bringing my own thought and perception and choices to the character and to the scene, but having a director really elevate your performance is a gift as an actor. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, one of the things you say that, you know, that uh, Joe Dante set the tone and, and you can tell, I mean, you know, when you look at his other work uh, and I'm a massive Joe Dante fan, it's it, it's there, it's in the show and it's one of those weird shows that it's a kid's show, right? And, I, yep. I, I, and there's no doubt about that. I, I've, I've recently watched it with my daughters. I've binged it just this last week and she's loved it. She oh. thought it was amazing. Um yeah. Uh, you were a favorite character, by the way. She she oh, she loves she loves Simon. Um, oh, that's great. But I'd, I'd say this: that sort of it had dark undertones. Like there were, there's definitely like overtones of things. Like you know, the character of Simon, oh, yeah. his family's never really explicitly explained. But there's a, a scene in right. one of the early ones where Marshall, yourself, and Marshall are sat in the bedroom, and there's some giggling and stuff going on. And it says, "Oh, you know, your parents are getting on." He's like, "Yeah, my mum's not home." And right. it's it's that sort of thing of like, and you never pick up on it. Was ever that, that was that ever discussed, or was it ever going to be grown in any way? You know, I think we got cut off early because we only had nineteen episodes, mm. and I, you know, the hope was obviously to do many more seasons. So I'm sure the writers had a lot of interesting uh, thoughts on where to take Simon and the character, and maybe you would find out about his family or what happened to his family. We never really got into that, uh, but I do agree with you tremendously that. You know, Simon's character, he was this latchkey kid. You know, that's why he really took to Marshall and Marshall's parents who sort of took him in a little bit and chaperoned him. Mm. But as as Simon, I would, like, come home to an empty house. We didn't really find out much about, you know, my parents. Um, 
But as you were saying, it was a kid show, but it was also, I think a lot of adults loved the show as well when they watched it in the early 90s because, you know, because of Joe Dante, because of Carl Schaefer and, and Jose Rivera, who were just, you know, brilliant writers, there were many references to, you know, films of the 50s and 60s. You know, The Fly, yeah. there was a lot of references to these old movies that they were inspired by, uh, Twilight Zone. And so, you know, a lot of things obviously went over went over the kids' heads, which is understandable because mm. they're kids. So kids could enjoy it because of the fun of the show and, and how it was written for them. But adults loved it too because there was just a layer of humor or a layer of uh, nostalgia or interesting lines or moments or props that they would be like, wait a sec, that's from a film that I saw as a kid. And, wow, this is really interesting and it's sort of spooky and scary. So... I think that was what really made the show very special. No, I agree. You know, watching it back as a, as an adult, and Grant, I've got nostalgia for it, but it really does yep. hold up. And there is those moments, yep. and everything from uh, the the werewolf character in, in one of the later episodes being called Mister Cheney, um, right. which is a fantastic nod. But there's also the, the, there's an episode I had completely forgotten about, and I actually watched it this morning. Was it's it's. I don't. Know if it's officially the last episode because it comes after the meta episode where it took, you know the the Marshall walks out on set, right? But it's the heavy metal episode, and um, it dawned on me quite quickly that um, cause it's got the whole thing of uh, reverse masking and all these other things about yes. that. Oh, cause I'm I'm doing an episode on the Satanic Panic coming up soon, and I was like, well, this whole episode is addressing the ridiculousness of the Satanic Panic, right? And it made me look back at all the other episodes. And I was like, actually, all these episodes are really quite. There's some episodes. There's some quite relevant and like um, pertinent sort of messages and you know themes running throughout the show. Actually, that I hadn't really thought about before. It was really well put together. I agree. I, I totally agree. I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of you know the writers had such a great vision for how they wanted the show, but they were brought up and wanted to reference a lot of things that had happened in their past or things that they were inspired by growing up and so that's weaved throughout the show and it's sort of on a second or third or fourth or fifth watching of the show I think the reason why it holds up so well is that you start to pick up all of these mm. references and there's a, a lot of heavy stuff that's going on in each episode where a kid you know are going to enjoy it for the entertainment value but they're not necessarily going to get a lot of that those deep layers oh no I think it's like I say, it's a shame that that couldn't have been developed because there's, there's, there is much more there to grow. Yes. But I suppose the question there is, so what happened? Why was it cut so short? Well, you know, I, I, I mean, I was a kid at the time. I, you know, uh, first of all, just getting a show to be on the air to begin with is such mm. a huge deal. I mean, so many shows try. Just to be able to shoot a pilot episode for a network is a huge deal. Then have that pilot picked up is another massive deal. Mm. There's so many pilots that are shot that... You know, don't get don't get picked up. I think there's a n- number of reasons. One is we were in a very bad time slot at the time. We were on NBC. I think it's 7:30 p.m. We were up against 60 Minutes, which was on CBS. Now, 60 Minutes nowadays, I don't think does very well in the ratings. But at that time, it was the number one show. Right. So we were up against the number one show on television, which is a v- very hard to compete against. Mm. Uh, we also, I think NBC didn't give us enough time to build an audience. Mm. The critics loved the show. I was going to say, yeah. Critical acclaim all the time. And people had had a tremendous cult following. But unfortunately, you know, NBC didn't give it the opportunity to breathe. And a second season, from my point of view, would have really tremendously taken off. And the show would have had you know, been a tremendous success, but they cut the life of it early. And, you know, back, I think in 2001 or 2002, Fox Kids ended up buying those Mm. 19 episodes and it was aired on Fox Kids in Saturday morning. And it was the number one show for Fox Kids. And they ended up remaking the show in Canada, Mm. uh, uh, you know, but it was terrible, obviously. (laughs) So that, that ended up not doing too well. But yeah, I think, you know, the reason why it was cut short, I couldn't answer that. You'd probably have to talk to the executives at NBC, mm. but from my point of view, those are a couple thoughts. I wish it hadn't happened because it was my favorite show, and my hope is now with, as you were talking about, the nostalgia for the 90s is so huge. Mm. In Erie, Indiana, I think 
is deserves to be brought back and rebooted in a new way that will bring the old fans back, but also create a whole new fan base as well. Oh no, I agree. I mean, you say like you know, even if they bring in a second generation, you know, like Simon yeah. and Marshall's kids or whatever. There's so much they could do, and it's totally. There's so much you could tap into now. It would be amazing. Um, I, I was always disappointed that sort of... Um, I don't know if Henri's really working much these days or what he's doing, but if you, I've always thought I'd love to have had you guys cameo in like Supernatural or The X-Files or, you know... That would be great. That would right, be amazing. Super I'd have loved to have seen that, just to see those sort of... The, the, just those character dynamics playing off again. Um, Call the creator of Supernatural. Call the creator of X-Files. Tell them. You want Simon and Marshall to have a little <laughs> you know, freelance? Uh, well, the, you're right. I would love that. That'd be great as an actor. It'd be fun. Uh, <laughs> but you're right. You know, a lot of the um, I've actually found out recently. I didn't know this, but a lot of the creators uh, that you know came after Eerie Supernatural. I don't know which ones, but there are several creators. Whether it's Supernatural or you know shows of that um, iconography that mm. have. Erie, Indiana, as some of their inspiration. Like they grew up watching Erie, and Erie is definitely a reference that they have when they were creating, you know, their new shows that have gone on to be, you know, tremendous successful shows, which is neat. Oh, definitely. I mean, one of the things is when I've looked at the re- when I've done the research, there's a lot of uh, those names that come up. Like I say, the guys that did uh, the, the brothers that have done Stranger Things and, and the guys that do Supernatural. The, in Erie, Indiana, gets mentioned. You know, it gets lumped in with things like. Um, the Twilight Zone and um, yeah. you know, Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps. It's, it's in there, and uh, right. but still doesn't seem to get the attention that it deserves. I agree. I agree. That's why I'm, I'm grateful to talk to you. And, you know, you're doing a podcast about it because I think that when people watch the show, they love it and they see all the references of what that show was and how it, why it is in the conversation with the Twilight Zone or an X Files or Twin Peaks. But a lot of people just don't know about the show because it only had 19 episodes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a small audience, but the small audience that did see the show or have seen it since it was on the air loved the show and would love to see more of it. So, I, you know, I love talking about the show because it's a big passion of mine. And, you know, it's the, the best show that I ever worked on in terms of, you know, from my heart. I just uh, have such a passion for the show. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear it and I, I totally agree. One of the things I was yeah, curious about is, is watching it, um, you know, uh, the character of Dash X, um, uh, when he's when Dash is brought in, did they ever did they ever give you an indication of where that was going to go? I'm trying to just understand it, because I actually really like the The character's great, and there's a lot yeah. of un- unanswered questions there. But when, you know, when they said, oh, okay, we're bringing this character in, you know, they pulled yourself and Omri into the cast aside, were they like, or did it just have happen? You know, it's a great question, Scott. I, I don't know the answers to that. I'm sure the writers had a plan mm. in terms of where they wanted to take uh, Dash X and where he was going to go. I just, unfortunately, because we got cut short uh, and the show was canceled, I don't think we you know really ever saw him fully developed and where he was going to, you know, what, what would happen to him. But, hey, if the show comes back, it's an opportunity to explore. It is, it is. Yeah. Um, so, really, what was your... F- Two questions, in really. Sort of one question, but two answers. What was your favorite episode to work on, and what is your favorite episode if you're to watch it back? Great question. Uh, my favorite episode to work on was definitely ATM Heart of Gold. Mm. It was a blast to be able to be in front of the ATM machine and it's spitting out money. And then my character Simon, you know, got to be sort of the big shot for an episode. I got to drive around in the limousine. <laughs> I got to go to the ice cream shop and have all these girls hang out with me and eat as much ice cream as I wanted. And so, just as a character and as an actor, it was so fun because it was it was, you know, sort of the alter ego alter ego of what Simon would fantasize being this big, macho, egotistical kind of guy would be, and obviously at the end realized, no, that's not who Simon is, mm. and it's not what he wanted to be, but, but I gotta live through that episode and have all of these arcs and sort of dynamic character changes in the episode, which was fun. Mm. Love that. And, you know, it, Simon had a lot of emotion um, and change in that episode, and I just love filming it. Uh, so I'd, I'd say that was my favorite one to shoot. Although I love shooting them all, I will put that as a caveat. <laughs> Looking back and watching them, I would say that's definitely up there as one of my favorite episodes to watch because I'm in, in uh, I'm the majority of that episode, so that's always fun as an actor to see yourself. 
Um, I also love watching the Retainer episode. I think that's so super cute. Yes. You know, our buddy who talks to dogs. Yeah. I think that's a blast. And I also, I mean, all the episodes are a blast, but I, the pilot episode is just so weird and, and interesting and cool. The Tupperware episode. Mm. Watch that. It's just like odd and creepy, but amazing as well. Uh, yeah. And it's, one of the things I've asked people about this and stuff, and everyone comes back to that pilot episode is such a strong opener. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the idea of Tupperware that can keep everything, including people fresh. Uh, I didn't realize I found out today, I was just Googling some bits and pieces. They did a toy. I think it was like a Wendy's or uh, something like that. There was a, like a Happy Meal kind of toy, and it's the twins in a Tupperware box. You're kidding. No, no, it exists. I've, I'm, I'm going to try and track. send that to me. you got to email that to me. I've never seen that. That is so cool. I will find you. I'll track it down. I will. I'll, I'll email you a link for it. Uh, I, I was amazed. That's great. Because um, the other thing as well, after the series, like you say, there was a second Eerie Indiana, The Other Dimension, which yes. I've, I've, I've had a look at and I'm a bit like, oh, like you say, it's not great. It feels a bit like a knockoff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the other thing is they sort of followed it, they followed it up with a series of books as well. Um, they like, right. So, um, I just find it odd that was there any ever ever any ever a discussion between the, the you know the ending of Eerie OG and anything else where they called you back and were like, okay, we're thinking of doing something else with it, or was it just all right? That that sort of version's done. You mean recently or in the past? Uh, in the nineties, so after it finished, between that and like other dimension, or with the books being created or anything, did they so ever contact? I, in all honesty, I went to go work on another show called Picket Fence and mm. on CBS. So I don't know if they ever contacted my agent regarding Yuri. I don't think so. I never was specifically told, "Hey, we're thinking of bringing Yuri back, and we'd like you to be a part of it. We want to bring back the old cast." In the nineties, I don't think that ever happened, um, or in the early two thousands. Now. Nowadays, uh, I know that there is talk of potentially bringing the show back. So it's a different story now, and, and it's an exciting an exciting story. So I'm hoping that that comes to fruition and Erie does come back, get back. We've had a few discussions about it, and uh, there's definitely you know forward momentum, which is exciting. That is very exciting. That would be brilliant. Yeah. I'd be very up yeah, for that. So. So I'm hoping, like you say, that we can raise some attention, raise the awareness, get people t- yeah, talking and, about it. You know, it's neat to be able to talk to you in the UK because I didn't realize I act I didn't realize that there was sort of a you know a big fan base in the UK, um, which is exciting to hear. They're doing actually a, a retrospective at some point in a couple months in October in the UK uh, about Erie, Indiana, which is neat. And I, we did one in Philadelphia in the States a couple months ago. We got a great turnout. So it seems like, you know, Erie is being talked about more mm-hmm. now than ever. And I think that, you know, the timing is, is great for it to come back on the air and, you know, sort of be uh, rebooted and rethought as to how the show will, will come and, you know, what's going to be explored. But, yeah, there's 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 a lot of momentum going on with Erie now that uh, – and it's great. It's exciting. I mean, you know, fortunately with social media nowadays, it has the opportunity to sort of the fan base take over and, and bring a show back. And so I just want to be a part of it. It's as I said, it's it's a, it's a part of my childhood that I absolutely loved. And uh, to be able to touch people in a way where they really felt that they connected with Simon and they connected with the show is a gift that uh, that, you know, I want to keep I want to keep being a part of. Yeah, yeah, no, and like I say, we'll keep trying to raise awareness, and we'll definitely, when this goes out, we'll put some links out for all those retrospectives, and people can look out for them all over. Thank you, Scott. And anything you want me to do in terms of pushing it out and you know talking about it or sending it out, let me know. I'm happy to do it. No, we will do. Just just before we wrap up, one last thing. So, sure. um, you were also part of possibly my other, well, one of my most my favorite shows of all time. I didn't realize until I did this that you actually did a voice on it because you've done a lot of voiceover work as well. Yeah. And uh, um, you were in the episode To Be a Clown on uh, the Batman the Animated Series. Yes. So it's, it's a Joker-centric episode. Did you get to work? Because the, uh, the way I remember that they, they say they did, they did it all in a room. Did you get to work yes. with Mark Hamill and, and uh, Kevin Conroy then to do that? I did, yeah. They're fabulous. And I see Mark, uh, you know, sometimes because he's a big voiceover actor, yes. obviously. A brilliant actor and just a wonderful person. 
Yeah, but when I did that Batman episode, I got to work with all those guys in the room, which is terrific. You know, a lot of times when you do cartoon and animation, um, they sort of stick you in a booth by yourself, and you record your lines, and then you're done. And sometimes you have the opportunity where they bring in the entire cast, and they'll read the script from top to bottom. Mm. And my personal opinion is I love that because it gives you the opportunity to work off the other actors in a more organic kind of nature. And we did that with Batman, and that was a, that was a ton of fun. Awesome. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you Absolutely. very much. You're it's, welcome, Scott. It's been Thanks awesome. No, no, thank you very much for your time. It's a Sunday afternoon there, so I'll, uh, I'll let you get back to it and... Uh, Okay, well, there you go. Great interview. Really great guy. Fascinating guy. Uh, he has a presence online. He's both on Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook. And then check him out, Justin Shankaro and all of his other work. Uh, but as he says, I don't see why they don't revisit this. Give it a reboot. You know, maybe Justin could be playing uh, Simon as, an, you know, as, a, as a grown man. And his kids take on the mantle uh, of looking into the weird of Erie, Indiana. Uh, you never know. But... It, I really enjoyed talking to him. I really appreciate him giving the time. So thanks to Justin and to all the fans of uh, Erie, Indiana. Like I say, get, shout it out. Raise the profile of this show. Uh, let's get this sort of show built up uh, and revisited. Like so many things are from the 90s at the moment. Um, you know, we've had re we've had the Twin Peaks uh, third series. We've had two more seasons of uh, The X-Files. Granted, they're darker and more adult. But, you know, they've redone Power Rangers and uh, all those kinds of things. Erie, Indiana needs to be put on the map, and I think people need to see it. So, again, check it out on YouTube, and if you like it, the DVD is readily available, really reasonably, actually. And I think it holds up really well, and will stand next to things like Goosebumps, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Slightly funnier, I think, than those, uh, but well worth a look. So... Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and as, uh, as always, uh, if you want to get in contact, you can find us at 20thcenturygeek at gmail.com. You can check out the website, leave a comment on there. That's 20thcenturygeek.com. I'm on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and many other things, all as 20th Century Geek. Find us, check us out. New edition, we've started doing it. We now have a YouTube channel, 20th Century Geek. It's got its own YouTube channel. There's some reviews up there. We're going to start doing some different bits and pieces. Uh, I've recently reviewed... Um, we've reviewed The Predator, The Nun, uh, Point Break, uh, Black Rain. And I've just put up, very recently, top 10 family films to watch during Halloween. Uh, and we have a talk about that. So go check that out. And finally, don't forget, uh, we are on Patreon. And uh, to our subscribers on Patreon, thank you very much. We appreciate those donations. They help keep the lights on in 20th Century Towers. But if you want more content, again, more reviews, more discussion, we're going to try and do up that again later in the year. Up that later in the year, getting some more special content out there. We shall see. Uh, check it out. It's all worth doing. So we'll be back with some more Halloween content very soon. But thank you very much for listening. And uh, we'll catch up again soon.